Hello everybody, Dr. Dan here and what I want to talk to you today about is an overview of healthcare insurance in the United States and it's incredibly complicated. So before I get started, this class is uh, all about whether or not healthcare is a right or a privilege and uh, we're really not going to talk about that too much in this particular module. Uh, but in order to understand where we're at with health care and if it's a right or a privilege or that sort of thing, we need to know where the country is at right now. So I'm going to try to cover it in eight minutes or less. One of the main takeaways from this module and this video is by the end of this video, you should know that health care is incredibly complicated in the United States. So uh, keep that in mind as we go through it. Probably the best way to start is to look at what is happening in other countries. So many of you may be aware that, that certain Western European countries, other Western countries such as Canada, the UK, France, and many others have what they call national health coverage or national health insurance. And in most cases, in most every case, these are what we call single payer systems. In other words, they're single payer systems because the single payer and administrator of all the health care uh, in these countries is the federal government. So Canada is a single payer system. The Canadian government handles all the transactions to health care providers in Canada, basically. There are exceptions, but, but that's what single payer means, is that there's one payer. In the United States, we're far from a single payer system. The government certainly pays for certain types of insurance, but private insurance companies such as Medical Mutual, Blue Cross, Blue Shield are also payers. So we're not a single payer system in the US, we have multiple payers. As far as the state of affairs in the US right now, in 1965 the federal government passed two programs, Medicare and Medicaid. We're going to get into these in more detail in subsequent modules, but for today just understand that Medicare is government provided insurance for the elderly and Medicaid is insurance provided for those who can't afford insurance, basically those in poverty. Now there are a lot of exceptions to this, so there are many other groups of people that are covered by Medicaid, uh, but for right now just understand that those are the two main programs, Medicare and Medicaid. When I say they're government funded, that means that you pay for them via taxes. So if you look at your withholding tax on your paychecks, if you're employed, uh, you'll see you know a federal government uh, tax deductions or money taken out of your paycheck, and part of that money goes to fund programs like Medicare and Medicaid. So we say they're government funded, but they're really funded um, via tax that is charged uh, to you, the citizens. So Medicare and Medicaid exist in the U.S. right now, and those have been in place since 1965. In 2010, Barack Obama signed the ACA uh, Affordable Care Act, and that was a new program that's purpose was to reduce the number of uninsured people in the country. The ACA is also known as Obamacare. They're one and the same thing. So, you know, I've seen protesters before saying, you know, Obamacare is terrible, but the ACA is great. Please understand they're, they're both the same thing. Obamacare is like a nickname. So uh, ACA was signed into law in 2010, and it's really complicated, but the major provisions were that there was an individual mandate. What that means is under the ACA, if a citizen didn't currently have insurance through Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance, they were required to purchase insurance. And the way that worked was the ACA set up something called insurance marketplaces, which were basically websites where private insurance companies would offer insurance plans to people who didn't have insurance. There was a federal government um, insurance marketplace website and some states handle their own uh, insurance marketplaces individually. But regardless of that, the individual mandate said that if you're not already covered under one of the other insurance plans I just mentioned, that you were required to buy insurance from one of these marketplaces. If you didn't buy insurance, you would be taxed. You would be penalized via a tax when you paid your income tax. So that's known as the individual mandate. The other major provisions of the ACA was uh, two of them actually, and they were uh, pre-existing conditions. So what that meant is that it was no longer legal for insurance companies to turn people down or to charge them more money because they had some sort of pre-existing condition. If I'm diabetic and I go to a new 
insurance company, they have to insure me. They can't say, hey, uh, you're diabetic, we're not going to cover you, or we're going to cover you and, 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 and charge you a lot more money. So pre-existing conditions, the requirement that insurance companies cover it was a major provision of the ACA. And another major provision was that dependents or children can stay on their parents' insurance plans until they're 26 years old. The idea there was that a lot of the uninsured people in the country are young people, people in college, people that are just starting out, and by raising the age in which insurance companies had to cover people, that would lower the number of uninsured people in the U.S. Those are the three main provisions to the ACA. There are many more. There are many that have to do with business uh, requirements that businesses that employ 50 or more people provide health insurance and, and a, a number of other things. But for right now, let's just think about these, these three major provisions. Again, the ACA was signed into law in 2010, and most of these provisions were going to go into place in 2014. But what happened was, in 2012, a number of conservative states in the U.S. sued the federal government claiming that the ACA was unconstitutional. And although the lawsuit is complicated, the root of it is that these states claimed that the federal government was forcing citizens to buy a product, in this case, health insurance. And there's no provision in the Constitution where the government has the right to force you to buy something. That went to the Supreme Court in 2012, and it was overruled. The Supreme Court found that the ACA wasn't forcing you to buy a product at all. All it was doing was taxing you if you didn't buy insurance, and it is constitutional for the federal government to levy a tax against citizens. So uh, the ACA was upheld in 2012, the major provisions went into effect in 2014, and it worked because in 2013 there were about 44 million people in the U.S. who had no insurance whatsoever, and by 2016 that number dropped to 26 million. So, so the ACA was an effective tool. Where we're at right now is the ACA is still in place, but in 2018, a conservative Congress voted to eliminate the individual mandate. And when that happened, another lawsuit was brought against the ACA saying that it was unconstitutional because now the tax or the penalty was eliminated and it threw the whole lawsuit into turmoil again. So uh, the Supreme Court will probably hear that case in 2019. I would, I would guess that um, in 2019-2020 that uh, the number of uninsured people in the U.S. will certainly rise and uh, part of that's going to be because of the elimination of the individual mandate. But we won't get into those specifics right now. Again, just wanted to stress that the current state of affairs in the U.S. as far as health care insurance goes is incredibly complicated and there are still 26 to 30 million people as of today uh, not covered by insurance. So obviously insurance is somewhat of a privilege because you have to be able to pay for it uh, to get it or you have to be eligible under other government programs. So that's it for now. We'll get into these individual programs in more detail in upcoming modules. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Take care.